Here she is from Albuquerque, Linda Moulton Howe. Hey, thanks, Whitley. It was a year and a half ago in January 2015, I received an email from a retired 60-year-old U.S. Navy petty officer, first class flight engineer. He asked me to only call him Brian to protect him because he works in an aerospace company today. He entered the U.S. Navy in 1977 and retired 20 years later in 1997 from the military. He and his C-130 crew encountered high strangeness in Antarctica from 1995 to 1996 several times. They all saw rapidly moving silver disks over the trans-Antarctic mountains. Brian and his crew also saw a huge football field-sized hole in the ice only about 5 to 10 miles from the geographic South Pole that was supposed to be a no-fly zone. But during an emergency medevac crisis to speed up their trip, they flew across that no-fly zone and saw apparently what they were not supposed to see, a huge hole in the ice that looked like it was an entrance to an underground installation. Later at camp near Marie Birdland, some dozen scientists disappeared for two weeks. When they reappeared, Brian's flight, Brian's flight crew was assigned to pick them up, and all were silent and appeared scared. Brian and his C-130 crew received orders to not talk about the silver disks or the huge ice hole or the missing scared scientists. Repeatedly, the crew was sternly told that they did not see what they kept seeing, but Brian was never asked to sign an official non-disclosure agreement. So now that he's retired from the Navy while still working in civilian aerospace, Brian wanted to share what he has seen and experienced with me at Earth Files because he is convinced that an alien presence is living and working on this planet. We had never met until Thursday evening, June 2nd, 2016, at the Contact in the Desert Conference in Joshua Tree, California. We organized to meet with his nephew, Kelly, and a friend to talk about Brian's Antarctic experiences. We all went to a local Mexican restaurant, and after dinner, we kept talking until after midnight outside in the restaurant parking lot under trees. That weekend, while I was still doing lectures, workshops, and panels at the contact conference, Brian returned to his home in Phoenix, Arizona. On Monday, June 6th, he was back at his aerospace job, which he has always kept confidential. I don't have a number there to call him because he wants to keep his job protected. But that morning, Brian received a surprising and disturbing phone call that he describes now. The voice on the other end of I was back at work on Monday after the conference, and my cell phone rang about 10.30, quarter to 11 in the morning, and the voice on the other end of the line said, is this Brian? And I said, yes, who's this? Because I didn't recognize the number. It says, I want to tell you that what you've been talking about, you need to stop talking about. And I said, what stuff was that? And he says, we know that you were with Linda Howe on last Thursday night, and we know that you went to dinner at a Mexican restaurant in Joshua Tree, and we were aware of what you were talking about with her and other people, and that your experience that you had when you were on the ice, when you were in the service, we don't want you talking about that. Specifically, we don't want you talking about the scientists that you picked up after being missing for a couple of weeks. And I said, how would you know about that? I've only talked to a certain people. And the voice in the phone said, well, we know pretty much everything. And then they said, just don't be putting that out there anymore. Certain people would prefer that you not talk about that. And I said, well, I'll consider that. And then the phone went dead. There was a click. Whoever on the other end hung up, I was like, wow, this is out of the blue. What did you do next? Well, I was kind of curious, so I took the number off my cell phone and Googled it on the Internet. It came back as the general phone number for the NSA. The National Security Agency in Fort Meade, Maryland. Yes. I called Kelly, my nephew, and he Googled it too. 
Why would you get a threat specifically using my name now in June of 2016? The only thing that I come up with is that report that's been going on the Internet of that British documentary team that was down there in Antarctica, right. something that was found under the ice. That team went missing, and they have not found those people since. Possibly that documentary team was in the same area where those scientists went missing for those two weeks, and that somebody doesn't want putting two and two together and going, well, you know, there's people down there that went missing for two weeks back in the 90s, and now these people are missing and haven't been found yet. Maybe there's a correlation there. The British documentary footage that Brian is referring to was first reported in a March 18, 2002 press release from the Atlantis Mapping Project in Washington, D.C., that began, quote, the U.S. government said it will seek to block the airing of a video found by Navy rescuers in Antarctica that purportedly reveals that a massive archaeological dig is underway two miles beneath the ice, close quote. The video was allegedly the property of a Beverly Hills company called Atlantis TV that produced the Atlantis Mapping Project channel for the BBC in London until 2015 when it was closed down. The March 2002 release also said that the Atlantis TV crew had disappeared and that two U.S. Navy officers had found the missing production crew's videotape, quote, in an abandoned supply dump 100 miles west of Vostok Station, close quote. That would be near the South Pole. The AMP press release said the video shown to National Science Foundation researchers at the South Pole's Amundsen Scott Station showed a pyramid and, quote, other spectacular ruins and things they could not go into, close quote. Allegedly, Navy SEALs came in one or more helicopters to take objects away. Officials of the U.S. Naval Support Task Force in Antarctica denied the story and said the Navy did not possess any video shot by the missing Atlantis TV crew. But at the same time, there was another U.S. legal action in 2002 to block the release of a hardcover book entitled Raising Atlantis by Tom Greenius, a novel based on fact. The book is about a secret U.S. military expedition that discovers ancient ruins two miles beneath the ice in Antarctica. The government allowed the first e-book version in the spring to be released with sensitive information about U.S. underground continuity of government installations, but blocked the hardcover release until the sensitive information was deleted. Could that big ice hole that Brian and his C-130 Navy crew saw near the South Pole in 1995 and the later incident in early 1996 of the missing National Science Foundation scientists be linked to the 2002 Atlantis Mapping Project news release about the missing documentary crew and videotape of pyramids and other structures beneath the ice? If the U.S. government is trying to cover up the discovery of pyramid and other structures two miles below the ice near the South Pole in Antarctica, the secret would be revolutionary because the last time the entire Antarctica continent was free of ice is generally considered to be about 15 million years ago. So any advanced architecture on land beneath the ice would be that old as well. Brian, would you have ever suspected that we were being spied upon and listened to in both the restaurant and where we talked on the grass near the parking lot? I would never have thought that. But now, my 20 years in the military, there are things that I saw that I really can't talk about that tells me and has shown to me that our government is capable of anything. Okay, so... Finding this out that they knew that you and I and other people were where we were that night, it does not surprise me. With the work that you do and as accurate as the information you find and as hard as you work to verify the truth of what you report on, I can imagine that you are watched quite a bit, <laughs> you know? We're supposed to be American citizens protected by the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. We are not doing anything that is wrong. No, I don't think we are either. And you were never asked in your service for the United States Navy to sign a non-disclosure agreement about any of those efforts in Antarctica, correct? Yeah. 
at the time when I was in the service and those incidents happened, we were verbally told we couldn't say anything to forget about it, but I never signed the non-disclosure of anything that I did while I was serving in the Navy. In Antarctica? In Antarctica, yes. Now let's play an excerpt from our original January 30th, 2015 interview. Here's this huge hole in the ice, almost like a cave entrance, but it was large enough that you could fly a C-130 into it, a hole that went down. We were told not to fly that area, but we continued our mission and picked up our medical emergency and turned around and had to come back to South Polder for refuel. And when we got close to that air sampling again, we were told, deviate this way so many miles and then turn back on course. We made our way back to McMurdo, and the entire crew was told to report to the skipper's office. We all got sat in this room, and this guy came in that nobody had seen before and said, okay, you guys saw this thing? You didn't see it. And he means the big, deep hole. Yes, big hole in the ice that was supposedly the air sampling station. We were told to not talk about it ever, and that area was considered off limits for research. In your email to me, you wrote, Talk among the flight crews was that there is a UFO base at the South Pole, and some of the crew heard talk from some of the scientists working at the pole of EBAs, an acronym for Extraterrestrial Biological Entities, working with the scientists at their air sampling camp, which is the large hole in the ice. Yeah. We're told not to talk among ourselves officially. But the guys, after a flight, you know, you have a few beers, and it's like, yeah, I heard these scientists talking about that there's some guys there at Pole that were working with these strange-looking men. They weren't saying, you know, alien or extraterrestrial or whatever, and that the air sampling station was actually a joint base with the scientists and the ETs. In your email to me, you said, quote, None of the scientists would talk to any of the crew on the plane, and they looked scared. That was a mission. It was probably a a two-and-a-half-hour flight from McMurdo in the middle of nowhere. We put this crew out there McMurdo had lost communication with. You're supposed to check in every so often by radio to tell McMurdo that everything's okay. So after they hadn't been heard of, we got sent back out there. Nobody around. All the equipment was still there but the entire camp was gone. We called McMurdo on their radio to make sure that the radio was working, and we could hear McMurdo fine. A week later, supposedly these scientists had gotten back to camp and wanted to be picked up. And we went back in there. After we got airborne, I went back looking around, and these people's faces, they looked scared is what they looked. And I asked my loadmaster, where have these guys been? And he said, I don't know, I can't get any words out of them. Blank stares, and he offered them food and stuff, and like, nobody would take anything. And so they get back to McMurdo and unload their gear. It was put in isolation. Kind of weird, why is that stuff being isolated? With everybody talking in the camp, all the civilians. Yeah, those guys went back to Christchurch, and they had a special flight to these guys. And nobody said anything. Am I understanding correctly that Each of the science groups that you guys flew in and out of the Antarctic base, they knew they were going to work with extraterrestrial biological entities down in that big hole. What somebody had overheard was that there was an installation joint venture at Pole, not necessarily at the South Pole Station, but in the vicinity of South Pole. They were conducting some kind of project between extraterrestrials and the human scientists. Correct. It's like, man, what did these guys see? Why were they gone for two weeks that nobody knew where they were? It makes you wonder, it's like, okay, so what is our government and other governments doing that we don't know about that's going on down there with visitors from somewhere else? And what possibly is still going on down there? Brian, what can anyone do? to an agency that calls up from anonymous voices who do not even identify themselves by name or agency they are calling from, and then try deliberately to intimidate. 
I don't know what we can do. If the government says it's not going to happen or shut up, that's what happens. I think people just have to come forward and tell what they know. It's like one person stands up in a crowd and says, no, I'm not going to do it. And you know what? Somewhere in that crowd, there are other people that feel the exact same way. And if one more person stands up and one more person stands up, pretty soon you've got a crowd and we need to get back into that kind of mindset and make the government serve us and not us serve the government. Brian, would you please read the email that you sent to me? Okay. Linda, I was listening to your reporting, Bill Tompkins, and his knowledge about the alien races and the agendas they are attempting to carry out. I started to realize the things that my father had told me in his ending years of life that now made total sense to me. His account of the times during World War II flying bombing missions over Germany, the balls of light, which he called Foo Fighters, his two missions that he thought he and his crew were not going to make it back from Germany because his plane had been shut up so badly, flying only on two engines. And when he thought that everything was lost, he told me that he turned to his co-pilot, and there sitting between them was the image of Christ. He told me that Christ put his hand over his hand on the throttles of his B-17 and pushed him up to full power. This next thing my dad then said is what he was engulfed in a white light so bright he could not see anything in the cockpit of his bomber. And then the next instant, his plane was over the English Channel and he had lost several hours of time. As my dad was telling me about this mission, he was upset and crying. I had never seen my dad ever cry before in my life. Until the day my dad died, he would not say any more about that mission. He would tell me about his other missions flying over Germany as many times as I wanted to hear them. That one, only once, did he talk about. That mission, I believe, was one of the Foo Fighter encounters he had and his crew may have been abducted and then returned to the aircraft just before the plane reached England. Our family lineage is Nordic and Norwegian and goes back to the Viking clans. My dad's side of the family are all blue-eyed blondes, and my mom's side is German descent. What your guest Bill Tompkins was telling me about Nordic reptilian connection and some of the Nordic-type alien species has me wondering if my family is involved with that somehow. My dad also talked about his dreams of what he called reptile men during his time flying missions over Germany. He would laugh that off and say that he probably read too many comic books as a kid, but I think it scared him, and he had encounters also with the reptilians during one or more of his flights over Germany. I think all this means something, and hearing Bill Tompkins has triggered a better understanding of things that have happened. Bill Tompkins, who Brian is referencing, is now a 93-year-old retired aerospace engineer and author of a recent book entitled Selected by Extraterrestrials, My Life in the Top Secret World of UFOs, Think Tanks, and Nordic Secretaries. Mr. Tompkins' extraordinary life included flying all over the United States, in the 1940s to secret sites at Lockheed, Northrop, Douglas, and other aerospace companies and top universities that were doing secret work for the United States Navy. In May 2016, I did an interview with him for my news website, earthfiles.com. Bill Tompkins told me as a young man in early 1942 he was inducted into the U.S. Navy where he was asked to make scale models from photographs of extraterrestrial aerial craft the various corporate Navy contractors had learned about through government intelligence operatives that included Nazi SS manufacturing of anti-gravity spacecraft. Tompkins also learned that behind Adolf Hitler in the Second World War, there were two different species of reptilian humanoids. One included what he called Dracos from the Draco constellation about 12 light years from Earth and known as a satellite of our own Milky Way galaxy. According to Bill Tompkins, Navy intelligence learned that humanoid reptilians from the Draco constellation were manipulating Hitler to annihilate the Hebrews on Earth and populate the whole planet 
with blonde, blue-eyed Nordics that were another type of extraterrestrial under the control of the Draco Reptilians. Bill Tompkins and his naval superiors were very confused by the idea that hostile reptiles and beautiful blonde humanoids were working together to take over planet Earth. Adding to their confusion were other beautiful Nordic humanoids that helped the Allies to defeat Hitler. That complex and insidious chess game haunted everyone then and still does today. Nordic blood and blonde-haired U.S. Navy flight engineer Brian and his father who saw Christ in the crashing jet in World War II, they are definitely good guys. But Whitley, who, what, and why are there blonde and reptilian humanoids that want to destroy Hebrew bloodlines and perhaps all of Homo sapiens sapiens? You talk about a difficult question. That, I think, qualifies as a difficult question. You know, I've had in my life experience with the blonde people, a couple of big experiences with them. One was a long telephone call with one of them who was, at the time of the call, uh, in a uh, uh, the home of a United States Defense Department physicist. What? Yeah, hold on, Linda. We decided not to edit this interruption out of the show for reasons that will become obvious in just a moment. I refer in it to my Awakenings series and the material in Awakenings 18, 19, and 20 relate to what Anne was telling me during this episode. And now let's get back to my discussion with Linda about what was happening. Linda, just let me go back. You know what just happened? Well, it sounds like a computer or something just popped up. Yeah, what happened was this. My phone is on silent. And suddenly Siri turned on and asked me if I wanted to call Anne's hospital. Oh, my God. Adam, it's sitting here totally untouched. Do you think Anne is there? Well, all through the interview, I've been feeling Anne's presence really strongly and, and, and getting a lot of, actually, of information from her about very deep soul work that doesn't seem superficially to have to do with the interview, but it's certainly going to be in my Awakening series that I've been doing on Unknown Country But let's now look again. We were just talking about these blonde beings, and I was talking about the ones I had interacted with, who were obviously not the bad guys. I've mentioned before on this show that the one I had the telephone conversation with was very wary of the greys, saying that if we started a war with them, they would never let us quit fighting, and they would never let us win, mm-hmm. which struck me as very like them in terms of personality as I understand it. I wouldn't be surprised if that would be exactly what they would do. Um, but there was another time when these two enormous blonde people showed up in my apartment in Manhattan, and who, which had rather low ceilings, much to their discomfort, and uh, I blurted out I, that I, uh, when they asked me how they could, what they could do for me, I, I said you could show me one of your children, which I've always regretted. And uh, e- yet they did a few weeks later in an airport in uh, uh, Colorado, in Stapleton, the old Stapleton Airport in Denver. And I've spoken about this many times, so all I will say is that Under the circumstances, they showed me one of their children, and with the child was the scientist from Boulder, from the foothills above Boulder, and a heavily disguised gray, about five feet tall, who appeared to be taking care of the gigantic six-year-old. It was a very, very strange...